I'm part of the global brand marketing team at GE Corporate, um, which means that I'm focused on creating original content for the brand and working across our businesses to tell the GE story. What I'm going to talk about today is visual storytelling at scale. So we've kind of locked into the power of visual storytelling, especially for a brand like ours. And our challenge is, how do we push that and scale that across an organization that's 300,000 plus people large, that's in 150 countries, et cetera? The first thing that I'll touch on is why we do this. Because many people look at GE and they say, you're a B2B brand. Why do you need to talk to the public? Um, and so we think about three things among many other things. We're thinking about a lot of things. Uh, the first thing is increasing awareness and understanding of the breadth and depth of what GE does. So in many cases in the US, people are aware of GE. They may, not, um, they may know it for things like appliances and light bulbs and the things that you see in your home. But they may not be aware that GE is manufacturing jet engines and power generation technology and healthcare technology. And so it's our job to deepen the understanding of, of that industrial work. The next is supporting a pipeline for young software engineering business talent. So as we have young folks who are coming out of school and who are thinking about Apple and Facebook and Google, we want to make sure that GE is in their consideration set. And then the last one, and, and this is um, certainly in the US, we think about the next generation of shareholders. So GE is a very widely held retail stock in the US. How do we make sure that we're reaching the 20-something year olds that are now thinking about what they're going to invest in? And the last thing I'll add to that is, you know, I think there have been times when we've had a very traditional impression of the 200 people that might buy a jet engine or a gas turbine and their world. But we also need to think about that a little less traditionally and think about the networks that influence them, the people who work for them, their teams, their associates, their families. And those folks may be part of a younger generation and folks that we may be reaching. So I'll just uh, touch on where we started, which I'm not proud of. Um, but this is uh, this was so when, when I joined GE, I joined about four years ago. Um, and we didn't have a Facebook page, we didn't have a Twitter feed. Our YouTube channel was a place where we uploaded content, but we weren't programming for it. Our site was hard coded. We went through a very big process to put it on a CMS. And this for us was our starting place and also a big, big area of opportunity. We started to think about how can we create content to reach an audience where they are. How are we thinking about our audience and how are we meeting them in the places that they are and around the things that they love? When we think about our audiences, we think about insiders, GE employees, that's a very big group of people, decision makers, so people who are um, part of our customer groups, enthusiasts, so these are people who love science and technology and our job is just to geek out with them and give them experiences that they wouldn't otherwise have, and consumers, the general public. So when you're thinking about all this industrial technology and infrastructure, the output, whether it's power or flights or whatever it is, GE is touching many, many people in ways that they may not be aware of. And in some cases, we do also want to make sure that our messaging is broad and reaching a consumer audience. We experiment a lot. So uh, we have played with things like BitTorrent, SoundCloud, Yo, we're on Snapchat, love Snapchat. Um, this is kind of a, a constantly changing map, but it helps us have some direction when we think about what, we, what message we're wanting to get across and what we want to achieve and where we need to start building that. Oftentimes people ask, with such a broad company, how do you organize the storytelling and the messaging? And we go through a very deep process at the corporate level and with our businesses to map out what are the business priorities for the year, where do we have growth, and which markets do we have growth. But from just kind of a love of science and technology standpoint, I just wanted to share this. This is a list that we worked on um, last year in partnership with our global research organization. So we have a global network of R&D facilities that we're doing, we're working very hard to get the word out about them because many folks don't, aren't aware that we have that. Um, in the US and in Brazil and in India and in China, these um, uh, groups of some of the most amazing scientists and engineers that you'll ever meet. And this is what we kind of called the next list. It was the six big areas of innovation that we thought kind of permeated all of our businesses and we're going to help move these industries forward. So we think about things like giant machines that are operating in incredibly harsh environments, material science, the industrial internet, big data, understanding the unmapped mind, 
brilliant factories, what happens when you're, when you're manufacturing in a connected environment, and energy everywhere, what happens when you can provide energy to people off the grid in remote locations. So in some of the work, you're, you'll see kind of the, those same themes come through over and over again, and they're a bit of a guiding light for us, no matter what story we have to tell. And then really quickly, this is an exercise that we went through probably about two years ago, and it was focused on our YouTube channel and our digital programming, but it's been really helpful in terms of defining what experience we want to create. And I think for any marketer, having a voice slide, just these three statements, is a super powerful kind of guiding voice. So when we think about what what we want to put forward with our digital programming, we think about reaching enthusiasts with interests and topics important to GE. Are you interested in 3D printing? Are you interested in engineering? Are you interested in software? Those are areas where we have shared passion points and we hopefully can show you something that you haven't seen before. And our objective is to deepen the understanding of GE's commitment to a better future through science and technology. And the strategy is to ignite a lighthearted curiosity around science and tech and open our doors. So we know we don't have very long to get people's attention. It's all about about getting their attention quickly, very much through things like visual content, and then giving them an experience that they wouldn't get elsewhere. So I want to talk about some of the work. Um, and a lot of what I'm sharing today is photos, so it's a great opportunity. I'm going to share my travel slideshow from GE. But Instagram is one of the first projects that, that um, we launched, and I launched when I got to GE. And the idea was there might be a way to showcase our factory floors and our labs and our machinery in the field and with the customers um, that's beautiful, and there might be kind of a beauty and a geek out factor here that we haven't necessarily tapped into. And it was an experiment, it was totally experimental. So we launched the feed maybe three and a half years ago now. We were one of the first brands on the feed. Uh, we were certainly the first B2B brand on the feed. And what we saw from the community was for people who kind of had an interest in big machines and science and tech, opening up our doors and showing them what it looks like when you manufacture a jet engine or a steam turbine was getting their attention. Um, after a little bit, we started to think about how can we build this experience? So how can we not only tell the story ourselves, but invite people in to help us tell that story? We love doing that across our platforms. So we started launching InstaWalks, where we would take groups of Instagram super users and, and um, some of the famous Instagrammers and some of our GE super fans and put them together and invite them inside to one of our facilities to shoot together. So you had cases where you were allowing people onto your factory floor and you were allowing them to do it with their favorite Instagrammers, and they were getting an experience that they wouldn't have any other way. The first one that we did was at our jet engine test facility in Peebles, Ohio. This is where we test the GNX engine, which is on the Dreamliner, G90 that's on the 777, and it's in a very remote location in the middle of the forest, and it has indoor and outdoor sites. It's just like a really cool Star Wars experience. This is um, a, the turbulence control structure that you hook up to the end of the jet engine as you're putting it through the tests. I'll tell you, we had done some shoots, but nobody had kind of brought this humanity and this creativity and the off-the-cuffness to the shoots before. This is the wind tunnel that pushes the wind into the jet engine um, as we're testing it. We had not done a jumping shot until he came up with it. Um, and it was just a great opportunity for us to bring our community together and invite them in. And we did it again. We did it in Texas uh, on the factory floor where we make locomotives. We invited people to climb wind turbines with us. Um, and so this strategy of kind of visual storytelling and doing it with the community has not only been important for Instagram and our social channels, but it's evolved the visual language of the brand. And we do it all over the world, sometimes our own shoots, sometimes with a group. This is in... Um, at the no northernmost end of Norway in the Arctic, where we're working on a project with Statoil. It is an incredibly serene, beautiful place. It was one of my favorite shoots of last year. You really find yourself in a town of 8,000 people in the middle of the Arctic. Um, this is from our jet engine test facility in Dubai, which is in the middle of the desert in a big box. And inside, we're doing beautiful things from the Dubai Air Show. And so I would say that you know, last year, we probably shot content in 15 to 20 countries. And when I think about content strategy at scale and what's been really impactful for us, governance is important. But I think what we found is that governance through enablement rather than governance through policing is what's driven the best results. So we could have spent our time gathering up all the Facebook pages and all the shoots and trying to make them perfect in the way we thought they should be. But instead, what we did, what we had the opportunity to do, was start experimenting and then invite our global partners and our business partners to join us based on the results. So I'll talk a little bit about how we've kind of leveraged the Percolate system to help 
create that enablement. Um, and the features that, you know, if you guys are on Percolate, you're familiar with these, but what we've really found super useful, the first thing is the content calendar. So the, the, the first conversation that comes up when you talk about content strategy is, oh, you need a content calendar. And you do it in an Excel sheet, you do it in a Google Doc. Um, getting all of our teams, we have, we must have 10 different teams at the corporate level on the US content calendar. And we're all able to plan and iterate together. And it's become kind of the foundation for our weekly and our monthly planning. And we have our global teams in the same space. We're all working out of the same media library. So again, enablement, not policing. Making sure that all of the assets that you've seen, that you're curious about, that are being pushed out, are available for you to find in one easy to use place. You can edit them. You can use them as much as you like. Um, and as we're onboarding our teams, we probably have 19 different countries and 10 of our business teams on the same platform. They're creating more assets through Percolate than ever, and they're, using, they're creating more assets with these images than ever. So by making the content available where our teams need it, instead of driving them nuts by telling them about the things that we can't do, we've been able to enable them to get on board with this kind of visual language and the new way that we're starting to talk about the brand. So what's next? When we think about content at scale, I'm going to share two more things with you guys that um, I just really love and, and are kind of opening our minds to new ways that we can create experiences. The first one is virtual reality. Anyone in here put on an Oculus Rift? I imagine many of you have. It's mind blowing, changes your life. Um, so we had launched our first experience at the end of November. And I think one of our challenges is that we operate in places and locations and at facilities that few people have the opportunity to visit. So visual storytelling allows those people to come in. Virtual reality allows those people to come in. Um, the first experience that we ran, and if we can just roll the video and I'll just kind of talk over it, uh, we launched in November, and it was around the work that we're doing in subsea oil and gas. We launched a, uh, we opened a new research facility in Brazil, in Rio, and half to 60% of their focus is around this work. And we thought, what better way to show it off than by taking people down to the bottom of the ocean and talking to them about what goes into a subsea factory. So when folks sat in this, we had it set up with a rumble chair so that you're actually sitting in a single person submarine, you're feeling yourself break the water, and you're able to go down to this environment that you actually wouldn't in real life really be able to visit. Um, and you're doing it here in a, in a very quick way, in two and a half minutes, and you're learning a little bit of more about what we're doing. Um, and you also have the opportunity to actually see the product. I would say of our content experiments, we found virtual reality uh, to open up opportunities to reach customers in very direct ways. This is going around the world. It's, uh, we launched it in Brazil, it's now in Italy, it'll travel to four or five other countries for oil and gas um, and subsea trade shows. Just a really, really great experiment and a great opportunity. It's gonna be on the Oculus Share site, we're gonna adapt it for Samsung VR and Google Cardboard. It's a lot of fun. I would encourage you all, if you can get your hands on one, to um, spend some time with VR. And then the next one that I'll just talk about is um, on the next slide, or we can just hang out at the bottom of the ocean, thank you, um, which is very relaxing, by the way. Sometimes you just kind of want to sit in there and watch the fish swim by, um, is uh, thinking about moments in pop culture that kind of transcend language, region, et cetera. So we're thinking a lot about how do we increase our programming and, and the strength of our programming in places like Brazil, in places like China and the Middle East. And how do we be careful to create experiences that are made for that market? But how do we also make certain pieces of content or experiences accessible based on pop culture threads that really travel around the globe. So this is something we did last year, and we've done it a couple times. We've captured um, audio sounds from GE machines in operation or in testing, and we've worked with DJs to create original tracks from them. So uh, the first time we did it, we did it with our partners at CSX. We went to a, an intermodal station for a day, captured everything. We had a DJ named Ruben Wu, who's based out in Europe, mix an original track for us. It was super fun. Last year, we did it with Matthew Deere, who's based here in New York. He went up to our global research facility. We had a conversation about the importance of sound as a data source for how our machines work, how they're testing, and then as a creative source for making music. Um, in addition to that, we had a YouTube creator named Nonstop. I don't know if you guys have seen him. Uh, Pop and Locker, super talented come to our jet engine test facility and do a performance, an original performance, to the drop science track that we had created out of the sounds of GE machines. 
so much. It was like my favorite shoot ever. I grew up in dance class, so I was like, this is perfect. Like, I can just stop now. Um, but uh, we launched it launched on YouTube, on his channel, got a fair amount of traction. But then our China team grabbed it and put it on our Yuku channel, and it got 100,000 views just organically with like no audience over there in a week. And if any of you guys are managing YouTube channels, you know that having your own channel and building that audience base without any advertising and building momentum is a tricky thing. So to see this video kind of take off and understand that this was about the art and the story behind the art and celebrating the intersection of art and technology and that that translates was really important, was a really kind of important moment for us. So the last thing I'll do is just show this video. It's a lot of fun, and that that's, will be it. Thank you.